Welcome back. So today I'm going to talk about the hill that I will die on, which is temperature control during fermentation. And you may not think that this is a huge deal, but it is. It's a very, very big deal. I get this question all the time. What's my number one brewing tip? And it is to control your fermentation temperature. If you get good beers in winter and crappy beers in the summer, this video is for you and all you new homebrewers who may have not stumbled upon this being a huge deal if you're trying to troubleshoot your beer and this was me like up until a year ago this video is for you this if if you're keeping your sanitization practices up if you're brewing decent recipes but you're still getting like super phenolic bitter beers that's why. So before we get too far into the video, just wanted to give you a little disclaimer that um, I am not in fact at 1.5 speed in this video. That is just me being excited. So just wanted to let you guys know what we're actually going to talk about because I go through them real fast. So we are going to cover using a water bath for fermentation, kvike yeast, pressurized fermentation, glycol systems, fermentation chambers, and fermenters with heat exchangers. And if you're looking for the equipment, it's all below. And yeah, maybe put me on half speed. I tend to speak fast when I'm excited. So there's multiple ways that you can basically hack this. Um, so in the beginning level, if you have one of those big party tubs, like those red bins that you throw beers in at parties, um, you can actually fill those with water, throw your fermenter in there, and it will kind of keep your temperature more steady. It works best, obviously, if your surrounding temperature is below 80 degrees. And, you know, you can keep adding ice if you're above 80 degrees or at 80 degrees or pretty much anywhere above 70 degrees, you're gonna wanna do this. Um, in my old apartment, I didn't have an ice maker in my freezer. I had a crappy little apartment refrigerator and it took me honestly four years to even buy ice trays. So I would have to go buy ice. One thing I wish I had was a countertop ice maker. So I just got this new air ice maker and it's pretty inexpensive. Um, I think it's like $120 and it makes ice every eight minutes. It can make 33 pounds a day and it's just really small and compact, which I love. Uh, what I do with this thing is I actually let it run ice until it's full, throw it in my freezer, and just let it keep going so that I can refill my actual ice tray. My ice, my ice maker in my new refrigerator is really, really, really slow. So even if I have a party, it's like we're out of ice in like five minutes. It's something great to have. I've been using it for a few weeks now and it's just really great and it makes those cool like bullet ice cubes that are like the fancy ones at hotels or whatever <laughs> if you want to get one of these and i honestly recommend it for the amount of money you would spend buying ice at the grocery store which is like insanely expensive for some reason uh you can get one of these at in like 10 bags you're paid up so uh, i've got a link below there's also a 10 percent discount code below uh so check that out so one thing that I've gotten super into lately is actually Kvike yeast. Um, so this is by Escarpment Labs. It is a Hornadel Kvike blend. I've also been using uh, the Lelamond Voss Kvike blend and I've made three beers with it and they are perfect. Um, in addition to using the Kvike yeast, I've been doing pressurized fermentation and you can see a video of that here. And what that does is the off gases from your yeast eating all the sugars create CO2, right? So that gas has to go somewhere, but you can get something called a spunding valve that regulates the amount of CO2 that it escapes so that it keeps your fermenter pressurized. Now, this is a warning. You cannot pressurize ferment on every fermenter. You have to get one that is pressure rated. So I have one by Keg King, the Snub Nose Firm King. Um, a bunch of different brands make them. Spike has some that are stainless steel as well if you want to get super fancy with it. Um, I believe Blickman and SS also make some. But if you want the cheapest, uh, the Keg King one is great and they're about to start being 
distributed by Blickman themselves. So, so another nice thing about doing the pressurized fermentation is you can basically just take a ball lock valve, hook it from your pressurized fermenter to your keg, and that's a closed transfer. Easy peasy. These beers turn out super clean and crisp. I actually just made a Kvik lager, fermented at 90 degrees, and I was drinking it within a week and a half. Like that's mind blowing to me. I don't know about you guys, but if you're used to making lagers, it's like a six week process. If you can cut that down to a week and a half, I feel like I'm always running out of time when I'm brewing because I have like an event to serve or something, or I'm having a barbecue and then I have no beer on tap and I'm like, oh no, it's in two weeks and I can't make a beer in that time. So this is actually a way to kind of cheat that system. If you're getting more advanced, uh, you can do some other things such as get a glycol chiller. These are not cheap. Unfortunately, I have a glycol chiller by Craft Brew. It's called the Stasis, and it basically runs two lines of glycol, and you set the temperature, and it will keep your beer at whatever temperature you set it. Uh, it reads through a temperature probe and set it and forget it kind of deal. I've made lagers with this. I've made ales with this. This is what I was using in my old apartment when I didn't have any temperature control besides a wall unit AC that could not keep the room below 85 degrees, which I was like, why the hell is all my beers turning out crappy when I have this AC set at 65 degrees? And then I threw a actual thermometer in there that took a high and low reading. And I'm like, oh, it's actually 85 degrees, not 65 degrees. Cool, great. I'm glad I ruined all those beers. I actually also have a fermenter uh, by Brew Built that actually has a heat exchanger within it, which I haven't opened yet, so I can't really tell you more about that, but I am going to do a video later this summer about how that works, and I'm so excited because, you know, it you don't have to run glycol, it like basically has an AC within it. It's pretty freaking nifty. If you have space for larger equipment, you can actually build yourself a fermenting chamber out of an old ice box or like stand up freezer, whatever. You get one of these uh, temperature controllers that you plug the freezer into and it has a thermometer inside and it will basically regulate the freezer so that it never actually freezes. It just stays at whatever temperature you set it at by turning the freezer off and on. And uh, a lot of people use those, you know, you can kind of get a Craigslist freezer and do it relatively cheaply. I, I know a lot of people who have done it for like a hundred bucks or below and uh, they work great. But again, you do have to have like space because it's essentially the size of a kegerator. So if you're in a small apartment like I was, I obviously couldn't do that. And I think it would have blown out my circuits to have another kind of refrigerant running. You know, there's so many different ways that you can make good beer, but you just have to know what you're dealing with. And I think a lot of people are under the impression that once you brew, you're kind of done. But once you brew, the, the hard work actually begins. And I mean, if you've ever tried to keep a apartment or house in Los Angeles cool, you are fully aware of how difficult that is when it gets to 120 degrees outside. Well, thank you for listening to The Hill That I Will Die On. I promise I will stop yelling at people about this. It's just like so important and I'm so passionate about it because I want all of you to make amazing beer. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. I've got a Patreon if you want more of me. I've also got a podcast called Brewing After Hours and I will see you guys next time. I want to thank my newest Patreon member, Matt Dixon. Thanks so much for your support. Oh no. I gotta do that all again. My microphone is in my pocket. <laughs>